Chapter 7 Sacred Love in Daily Life That afternoon, I boarded the train back to Tangier and stayed overnight there. The following morning, I telephoned the only phone number I had with me at the time, a friend I met at Estalen, who lived in Paris. Laurent was very glad to hear from me and said I could stay with him as long as I needed to reorient myself to life in the West. I booked a flight from Tangier to Paris with a credit card I had not used in almost a year. The plane left that afternoon for Madrid, where I would have a four-hour layover before changing planes for the flight to Paris. I felt a vague anxiety by the time the plane landed in Madrid. With so much time before the next plane departed, I decided to take a walk to get some exercise and find a place to relax. The sound of people shouting, the bright flashing lights, the roaring of engines, the blare of car horns, and all the motion of people running to catch flights, truckers delivering crates, Conveyor belts and escalators moving every which way assaulted my senses after the quiet, slow routine of my previous months at the Zoya and Meknes. My head ached, and waves of nausea washed over me, so I ducked into a public restroom. I found an empty stall and stayed there for a couple of hours, so sick and disoriented, I was certain I would die there. I then started to cry, thinking how sad and embarrassed my parents would be to hear of my death in a public restroom in Madrid. I glanced at my watch to see I had only an hour before my flight for Paris left, and I started to panic because my stomach was still in knots, my head throbbed, and my muscles were as exhausted as if I'd been clinging to a rope over a cliff for hours. I slowed my breathing and tried to calm myself, the panic subsided to nervousness, so I stumbled, squinting out of the restroom into the hot, bright afternoon sun toward the airport. Once I boarded the plane, the cooler air in the jet relaxed me further, and I felt like melting into my seat. I actually slept most of the short flight to Paris, and my dreams placed me once again in the courtyard of the Zoya, smelling the flowering orange blossoms and bathing my feet in the cool water of the fountain. But it was the same shock all over again when I awoke and found the plane had landed in Paris and the passengers were crowding down the aisle to disembark. I entered the flow reluctantly and quickly found myself standing in the Paris airport. I stood there for several minutes, just taking in an environment that hadn't seemed nearly so alien a mere half year before. There were huge billboards and neon lights everywhere, and I hadn't seen either for months. And there was a sort of sexual, sensual smell in the air. The scent of women's perfume made me notice how men and women were flirting with each other and kissing and hugging. It was as if I was rediscovering one of my senses, and I realized I had just gone through the longest period of sexual celibacy in my adult life. After passing through customs and exchanging some money, I called Laurent from one of the payphones in the airport. When he answered the phone, he seemed very glad I had arrived and asked me how much luggage I had. A small suitcase and a sleeping bag, I answered. Oh, good, he said. I hope you don't mind riding on the back of my scooter. The traffic this time of day is horrible. We'll cut an hour off the trip this way. Meet me at the entrance to the parking garage. I should be there in 30 minutes. I asked directions to the parking garage, and after picking up my belongings, I only had to wait 10 minutes before Laurent arrived. I recognized his long gray beard and paunch at a distance, so I called hello to him as he drove his white Vespa up to the curb where I had been waiting. He wore jeans, a black leather jacket, and mirrored sunglasses. He strapped the sleeping bag to the back of the scooter and asked me to hold the suitcase on my lap as we rode. When we got to Lawrence's spacious left bank apartment, a few minutes later, he showed me to my room. I immediately lied down on the bed and jokingly asked him not to wake me until lunch the next day. 
I was so relieved to be in a quiet place and to be horizontal, I fell into a deep sleep that lasted 14 hours. I awoke quite refreshed late the next morning. When Lawrence saw me stir to find the bathroom, he called to me. Lunch won't be ready for a couple of hours yet, I'm afraid. I remembered my request from the night before and chuckled along with him. After a very light lunch, Lawrence packed a small backpack he asked me to wear, and we were on the road again on his little white scooter. We took small country roads in the direction of Rem, and within an hour or so, returned onto a private road. Cows grazed in the field on one side, glancing up for only a moment when the high buzz of the scooter's engine whipped past. Laurent was a filmmaker with quite a bit of money and free time. He had rented a chateau, and when we drove up to the building, I spotted small groups of Asian-looking men in orange robes wandering around the grounds. Who are they, I asked, pointing toward the brightly robed men. They are Buddhist monks, Laurent explained as we got off the bike. They're refugees from Tibet. The Chinese have stepped up on their torture and murder of the Tibetans in Lhasa, so many of them come here first until we can find new homes for them here in France or in Germany or Belgium. Come inside and I'll introduce you to the others. Among the others, there was a young French woman named Clarisse, an anthropology student at the Sorbonne in Paris. She was a woman of medium height with freckles, green eyes, and reddish-brown hair cut in the page boy style that is so popular in Paris. She was by no means a frail French woman of fashion, but wore a loose-fitting dress and appeared to have adopted not only the heavy, grounded way of walking that Tibetan monks use, but also their body build. She was a collection of full, round surfaces and had attained that buoyant, blissful demeanor of the Buddhist monk. I got settled in my room for the weekend and went back downstairs to talk to this attractive woman. She started talking to two of the monks in the kitchen when I came back down. I waited in the doorway until she was finished, and she approached me with a smile. Are you looking for me, or have you been overcome with ravenous hunger, she asked. Before I could answer, she had shuttled me into the hallway. Never mind that, she said with a grin. Answer this for me. How long will you be staying here at the chateau? She traced a line with her finger down my arm. I'm here with Laurent, I replied. He has to be back in Paris on Monday. I was somewhat surprised at her forthrightness after my encounters with the more demure women in Morocco. If you'd like to stay longer, I could take you back on Tuesday. I don't have any classes until that afternoon. Clarice leaned back against the opposite wall, still smiling. Are you here to study with the Tibetans? Yes, Buddhism has interested me for some time. If you want, maybe I could share some of what I know about Buddhism with you later this afternoon. Just then, Laurent joined us in the hallway. Clarice nodded at him and then answered me. I think I would enjoy that. She shook my hand, holding on for just a bit longer than the standard handshake, and went off outside, taking my attention with her. Her scent lingered in the air, where she stood only moments before. Sensing the sparks between us, Laurent turned to me and said, Be gentle with her, my friend. She has been celibate for a very long time. So have I, I countered with a chuckle. I will tell her to be gentle with you, too, then. I overheard you say you would be teaching her something about Buddhism later today. That would be interesting to witness, my friend. I folded my arms and gave him a quizzical look. Why is that? Well, let me see, Laurent began. I believe you will find that Clarice left home at the age of 13 and hitchhiked through Turkey and Persia to India where she met the Burmese Theravada Buddhist master, Gönka, and studied about three schools of Buddhism and the relativity of time and space for eight years. She returned to France last year to enter the Sorbonne on a scholarship and publish a book on the confluence of the teachings of Rumi and the Buddha. 
She is here to teach the monks meta meditation or heart meditation. So it will be interesting to see what you can add to her knowledge of Buddhism. Florence left chuckling. I felt sure this woman was attracted to me, but I obviously had to find some other way to gain her respect. There was a reception for some new Tibetan immigrants that evening. So after dinner, I was only able to speak with Clarice for a minute or two at a time before she was whisked off to be introduced to someone or another. She seemed very poised and serene for someone only 23 years old. I talked to Laurent for a while, and he suggested I sit in on her meditation class in the morning. As I climbed the stairs to go to bed that night, I noticed Clarice bowing to yet another orange-robed monk in the hall. Laurent knocked on my door early the next morning. It is sunrise, my friend. You said you wanted me to wake you for Clarice's meditation class. Do you want to change your mind? No, I replied as I struggled up to a sitting position. I'll be there. We meet in the garden. Go out the front door and follow the path to the right. Within 15 minutes, I was dressed and heading down toward the garden. Behind a hedge, I suddenly came upon a sea of orange robes. Approximately 30 monks were already gathered on the lawn, along with a few Westerners like Laurent, all in silent meditation. I picked up a mat from a stack near the hedge and joined them as unobtrusively as possible. I spotted Clarice's pulled back brown hair in front. After a minute or so, Clarice, seated facing the rest of us, opened her eyes and gave the invocation, which was a bit more inclusive than the one I had used with my healing circles back in Chile. May all sentient beings have happiness and its causes. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and its causes. May all sentient beings not be separated from sorrowless bliss. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free of bias, attachment, and anger. After this, there was another period of silence and then she began the meditation. Our task today is not to pray or meditate, Clarice began again. I am not here to teach you to meditate. She fell silent again. Heads started to turn, gauging the reactions of others to this statement. Did she really mean that she was calling off the meditation? I am here to make your life a meditation, she resumed. You must focus your attention on your heart, not on your mind. The mind will keep you from burning your hand on a flame or walking off a cliff, but it is the heart's intelligence that will keep you healthy and fulfilled. Many of you find that place of wisdom when you sit like this to meditate. I tell you, you must try to maintain that focus at all times. When you eat, you focus on your heart. When you bathe, you focus on your heart. When you talk with someone else, you focus on your heart. There can be no split between your ordinary life and your spiritual life. Many things can take us away from a focus on the heart, that essential part of ourselves that does not change over time. The most common distraction is action. When you see the wind blowing through an open window, and causing your papers to flutter off your desk, you might immediately go to the window and close it. I believe contemplation should precede all action. When I come upon such a scene, I watch the graceful twisting and floating of the pieces of paper as they fall to the floor. I feel the currents of air spreading throughout the room. I might go first to the desk to see what pages remain there, and then to the floor to see what the wind has put there. Perhaps the wind has decided to sweep aside the letters and plans that have been distracting me from my life's true purpose. Perhaps the wind has uncovered the letter I most need to return or the book I have put down and stopped reading for too long. What a great teaching I might have missed if I had simply acted to close the window and replace the pages on the desk 
without being observant and receptive first. I noticed how she held the attention of every person gathered on the lawn. Another condition that takes our focus away from the heart and locks us in the future or the past or in some storm of emotion is a lack of gratitude. Why do those with so few material possessions or so few friends seem to be more satisfied with their lives? Is it that they do not know what they are missing? No, many are very aware of all that they do not have. The difference is their gratitude for what they do have. To do otherwise is to invite sorrow. How can we be happy thinking about all that is not ours and beyond our reach? It is not a difficult skill to learn, my friends, she continued with a smile. It is the way we are born. It requires simply that we look on all things as new with the wonder and fascination of a child. Our busy lives are not diminished by this focus. We do not lose any of our other senses when we utilize the senses of the heart. The heart shows the eyes a more compassionate view of the world. The heart tunes the ears to the undertones and overtones that tell what the other person really wants. And the heart makes every decision the mind has to make much easier. It chooses the path towards one's true purpose in life. There are no values of time or money or influence to cloud what is truly best for us. Clarice was again besieged by students after the meditation. But this time I waited until the last had thanked her and headed back toward the chateau. I was impressed by your talk, I told her. Thank you, she said, as we started walking back. I am free until this evening, if you'd like to go over your knowledge of Buddhism with me. I fear anything I could say on the subject would be <laughs> redundant at best, I said with an embarrassed grin. Ah, she replied, you weren't paying attention during the meditation. Everything and everyone has something to teach, even the most accomplished of masters. We ate breakfast together and I told Clarice more about my insights into psychiatry and my experience in the Sufi community. She looked at me with both respect and full attention, and she politely interrupted to ask for an occasional clarification. I got a deep sense that she understood me. Our discussion of philosophy, medicine, and spiritual traditions continued for several hours and fueled our undeniable attraction to one another. In the haze of the mid-afternoon sun, we succumbed to our desire. Despite our long periods of celibacy, our lovemaking was not frenzied, but had the subtle power of a raindrop's ripple on a deep, still lake. Clarice's centeredness, so commanding in her speech and demeanor, was maintained in her lovemaking. She had a strong presence at all times, it seemed, which made her all the more alluring to me. Over the following weeks, Clarice and I spent more and more time with each other at the chateau and in cafes and parks in Paris. In the morning, as we were strolling along the Champs-Élysées, she turned to me and said, Carlos, I feel very fortunate to have met you. You have reminded me how important it is in maintaining one's physical health to stay in touch with life's meaning and purpose. You have provided a bridge between my teachings about heart-centeredness and the concept of the soul I had rejected as a teenager. We stopped walking. She turned to me and continued, I think it is time that you meet my parents. Why now? We've been romantically involved for a few weeks, and I have mentioned you to them. They want to meet you. I guess I have reservations because it implies a commitment I don't think I'm ready to make. She looked at me for a minute, as if she were studying my features for an exam. Perhaps it would be best if you moved on, she said at last. I was taken a bit by surprise. You don't want to see me anymore, I stammered. Carlos, I'm not a perfect being. I think you are very handsome and I enjoy your company greatly. I'm very happy when I'm with you. Yes, I would like to keep seeing you, but is there someone else? I blurted out. No, no, Clarice said amid chuckles and waving arms. Carlos, I have another meditation to teach you. 
Sit down here with me. She indicated a bench on the sidewalk, and we sat down there. From my point of view, it would seem very natural to introduce you to my parents and talk about plans for the future. But I was taught to put myself in the other person's place and look back at myself. I could see that you weren't ready to settle down and that I might seem like I was hooking you into a marriage proposal. That is not what I want from you. I will show you how I know that you need to move on. Look at my eyes. You must try to imagine looking out at the world through my eyes. Remember that I am younger, that I was raised here in France, that I am an anthropology student at the Sorbonne, and that I teach meditation techniques at the Chateau. Try to imagine what my needs might be right now. What might I be afraid of? Now look out through my eyes at yourself. You sit there on the bench, your hair tousled by the wind. You're wearing gray slacks and a blue sweater. You have a look of confusion in your eyes. Your breathing is deep. Try to imagine what you look like or seem to be from my perspective. Then you must remember that most human actions try to increase happiness. If I were to force you into a more committed relationship, I might be happy for a while because I will have achieved one of my goals. I believe I wasn't meant to continue the solitary celibate life of the contemplative, and you'll probably be happy at first for the same reason. You've told me you believe there is a soulmate out there somewhere for you. But you'd grow unhappy realizing that our commitment was keeping you from fulfilling your greater life's purpose. Your restlessness would eventually decrease my happiness as well. If I'm grateful for the time we've spent together over the past few weeks, that can be enough. When I looked at you a few minutes ago, I was practicing this meditation. I realized you had needs that could not be fulfilled staying here in Paris. In fact, you risk becoming too settled if you stay here longer. Am I right? I took her hand in mine. I keep wondering when I'll have learned enough, experienced enough, to be ready to share it with others. You share what you have learned all the time, Carlos. I know, I said, as I pulled her closer. Sometimes I get so tired of always moving on. Clarice settled against my chest and put her hand on my knee. Remember what you used to call us just after we met? I'm not sure. You call this icebreaker, she said, laughing. And like those ships that sail icy waters, we're not stopped by the hazards and opportunities of our environments. Loneliness. Ah, that too we can break through. Our sense of meaning and purpose is our home and place of power as we move from one location to the next or one relationship to the next. I knew Clarice was right, that at this time my life was my journey and I must continue along my path. But I also knew that one day there would be more, for I had experienced a vision years ago of what a complement to my life a soulmate union would be. I wasn't interested in moving from one relationship to another, but I knew that unless I had the ultimate heart certainty, I would not settle down. I knew that it was possible to share the oneness of spirit with another human being, and I refuse to settle for less. In a soulmate relationship, it would be possible to focus attention entirely on the soul of the relationship instead of its interpersonal mechanics. This would create a set of values that did not exist in other relationships. Only in such a relationship would I be able to settle down and to have children. I saw that relationships were the place where the soul works out its destiny. The soul is not concerned with making a relationship work because the soul's point of view is not an ambitious point of view. It doesn't make love a work project or a productivity project. It recognizes the mystery that is involved in the union and extension of our beingness with that of another person. I knew it was in my future and I was willing to discover it. The next day, I decided to contact Idris Shaw. Since I was in Europe, I thought it would be a convenient time to meet my longtime Sufi teacher in person. 
I would tell him what I had learned so far and see if he could suggest a new plan of study for me. By the following Friday, I had bidden adieu to Laurent and Clarisse and boarded a train to Calais. From there I took a ship across the channel to England and a train from Dover to Tunbridge Wells. At the train station in Canterbury, I was met by Shaw's secretary, a young blonde Englishman named Colin, who drove me by car to the estate in Langton Green. When we reached Shaw's home, we passed through a decorative stone gate with a bronze plaque set into the left pillar that read, Langton House. Beyond the gates, a dirt driveway wove through a couple hundred feet of bright green closely trimmed lawn to a huge white English country home. A small wooden sign at the turning circle of the house, where three other cars were parked, read, Institute for Cultural Research. Colin informed me that I would be staying in the cottage round back, so he told me to go in and talk to Mr. Shaw while he took my suitcase and sleeping bag to my room. I entered the front of the house, and immediately a small black-haired Afghani man in his 40s, wearing a brown corduroy jacket and a tie, poked his head out a doorway to the left. Doctor, he said with a twinkle in his dark eyes, it is so good to finally meet you in person. Come in. Come sit down a while with me, or perhaps you are in need of rest after your trip from Paris, eh? He invited me into a sitting room with an ornate fireplace and several plush antique chairs. He took two open books off of one of the chairs and sat down, offering me the chair facing it across a small coffee table. He told me he had to leave for a symposium at the University of Geneva in two days, but that we could talk in his spare time until then, and when he returned ten days later. By then, Colin had returned. Sayed, he said, you have a phone call. Work calls, Mr. Shaw told me. Colin will show you around, but not the Rose Garden, Colin. I would like to lead that tour myself tomorrow. Yes, sir, Colin replied. At that, Shaw got up and hurried down the hallway. I know his first name is Idris, so why do you call him Sayed, I asked Colin. It's Afghani for Prince, Colin replied matter-of-factly. Dr. Warder, if you'll follow me, I'll give you a quick tour of the main house here and then show you to the cottage. Since dinner has already been served, I can ask the cook to make up a plate for you. I would appreciate that, I said as I got up to follow Colin out. He certainly doesn't look the way I imagined. Were you imagining the turban and jalaba? Yes, I admit it. I, I guess I've been so accustomed to seeing Sufi teachers wearing them. That's why the staff calls him Prince, Colin said with the first hint of a smile I'd seen. When he wears the turban and jalaba, he really does look like some Afghani royal. Shah is descended from the Prophet Mohammed. He is a Sharif, and he is royalty of Afghanistan. At the end of our tour of the main house, we were in the kitchen, Colin pointed to a door leading out to the back of the house and said, The cottage is right out that door. I will see you tomorrow. When I went out the back door, there was a floodlight illuminating a flagstone path over the lawn to what seemed a very large two-story house with brick foundation and tall cathedral-style windows. I scanned at the backyard for the small cabin I envisioned as my home for the next few weeks, but I couldn't make it out in the early evening darkness. I went back into the house and caught up with Colin in the main hall. I'm sorry, I said, but I can't find the cottage. It's right there, he said with a scowl. You can't miss it. Just follow the path. Is it behind the other house? The other house is the cottage, Colin informed me. Oh, I meant to tell you that there are two bedrooms there, but you should have the place all to yourself. The guest rooms here in the main house should suffice. We aren't expecting many visitors in the next couple of weeks. There are linens and other supplies in the bathroom closet, but if you need anything you can't find there, let me or the maid know. She will come to tidy up at 11 in the morning, unless another time of day would be more convenient for you. I'm sure that will be fine, I said. I'm not a late sleeper. Well, then, good night, doctor. The maid should come round in a few minutes with that plate of food. At that, the young man went upstairs 
and I wandered back out to the huge structure they called the cottage. I wandered around inside it, admiring yet more beautiful antique furniture and rugs. After my months in Morocco, sleeping on the floor with 60 other men and having virtually no possessions, the opulence of this little cottage made it seem like Buckingham Palace. I forgot to draw the drapes in my bedroom that night, so I awakened the next morning shortly after sunrise with the warmth of sunlight on my face. I showered, dressed, and wandered into the kitchen of the main house. There, a young boy and girl were sitting at the round table, arguing with each other. A short, thin, dark-haired woman frying eggs at the stove and smoking a cigarette called over her shoulders for the children to pipe down. Hello, I called out. Oh, she said as she turned around to face me. You must be Dr. Warder. Welcome to Langton House. I am Shaw's wife. Pleased to meet you, I said. These are your children. She took another long puff from her cigarette, seemingly ignoring my question. You two settle down and be patient. Your food will be ready in just a minute. She looked up at me with her beautiful almond-shaped eyes again and exhaled smoke as she spoke. We'll have breakfast for you and the other guests in the sitting room. It won't be ready for another half hour yet. These two are spoiled, so they get fried eggs. You'll be having juice, tea, and rolls. That'll be fine, I'm sure, I managed to say before she continued talking to the two youngsters I had to assume were her children. The smoke started to bother me, so I decided to go back out to the cottage for a few minutes to wait for breakfast. When I passed through the kitchen again 30 minutes later, there was no evidence that Mrs. Shaw and her, the two children had been there except for the strong smell of tobacco smoke. I made my way to the sitting room where a table had been set up buffet style with the promised juice, tea rolls, and marmalade. After a few minutes, Shaw burst into the room and took a seat near me. I will be leaving for Geneva tomorrow, he said, so I will be fairly tied up today. But perhaps we can talk tonight at dinner. I know. Would you like to take a walk with me in the Rose Garden after breakfast? I would be delighted, I said with a smile. Oh, no, he said with mock trepidation. Being pleased would be quite enough. I always worry that I'm in the process of being deified when someone says they are delighted to meet me or delighted to be spending time with me. I'm not a guru type. I have written over a million published words at this point in my life. I much prefer to be thought of as a writer, a storyteller. I think of myself as an importer of ideas. I'm bringing the wisdom of the Sufis to the West so that more people may be activated. And now I must get some breakfast. When he returned with a plate full of rolls, he began to furiously break them open, butter them, and spread them with marmalade as he continued. You are, of course, familiar with the Apostle Paul. Yes. He wrote, be in the world, not of the world. That is the principle which I teach as well. I remember, I interjected, you wrote that the objective was to become an invisible Sufi. Precisely. One's spirituality should blend in with the rest of one's life. Colin appeared again. Good morning, Syed. Don't tell me the phone calls have begun already, Shah told Colin. Then he apologized to me. I will return shortly, and you will see why I put up with the frantic pace here at the Institute. Nearly an hour later, Mr. Shaw reappeared, still gnawing on one of his breakfast rolls. Come, come, before the phone rings again, he told me in conspiratorial tones. He led me to a garden on the side of the house with several dozen rose bushes of various types. He pointed out the names of each type of rose as we strolled, and we talked about my experiences. I didn't always understand what he was saying, but I felt odd asking him to clarify since he would say, you seem a very intelligent man, doctor. Of course you know what I mean. What I described as soul awareness, he referred to as activating one's essence. We as humans have within us an essence, Shaw explained, initially tiny, shiny, and precious. It does not grow as our bodies do. We must develop this essence through our own effort. Although we are responsible for developing this essence in ourselves, the development starts with the activation of the teaching. That is what the stories are for. When the mind is cultivated correctly and suitably, 
it becomes more stable and constant. Your consciousness is translated to a subliminal plane. I feel like I've been activated as you say, I told him, but I sometimes have difficulty maintaining that awareness. I've explored many different spiritual techniques, but no technique seems to be able to help me as consistently as the original one. Shaw stopped walking and got out a handkerchief to mop his brow. There's a story that speaks to your dilemma. There once was a monkey that came across a tree in which long yellow fruits hung in huge clumps. The monkey climbed the tree and picked one of the strange new fruits. It smelled sweet, but the skin seemed a little rubbery. So he peeled the skin off and ate the softer fruit within. The monkey was overcome with joy and felt this was the most delicious fruit he had ever eaten. He called the fruit banana and went on his way. A few days later, he came across another banana tree. He climbed this tree and picked one that seemed firm and fragrant. When he peeled it and took a few bites, the monkey felt it did not live up to the exquisite taste of the first banana. It was still good, but since the second banana did not compare to the first, he decided not to try any further bananas. He would keep the memory of the first banana in his heart. A second monkey came across one of these strange new banana trees. He climbed the tree and picked one of the long yellow fruits too. He too peeled the skin and was overcome with joy at the first soft, sweet bite. He gobbled up the rest of it, and he too declared this to be the most delicious fruit he had ever tasted. He picked another banana from the same tree, peeled it, and took a bite. This second banana was also very good, but the monkey was disappointed that its taste was not as exquisite as his memory of the first banana. He climbed down the tree and began searching for another banana tree. When he found one, he climbed up and picked one banana after another, peeling them and taking a bite out of each. But the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth bananas did not live up to the divine taste of his first banana. So he kept on searching the rest of his life for a banana that tasted as good as the first one he happened upon. So part of my difficulty, I concluded, is that I keep searching for an experience like that month with Francoise back in Chile. And it was the newness that made it so special and so long lived. And part of the difficulty, Shaw added, as we resumed our walk, is because society still reinforces the idea of two separate cultures, the material and the spiritual. We are entering a new age of information that will supersede the notion of two cultures. We have been learning facts. Now we need to learn how to learn. It is a sort of opening, making oneself available to the wisdom of the universe, rather than going out to capture it. Once that information revolution occurs, there will be a consciousness revolution, the emergence of one integrated spiritual culture. I come across so many seekers, Shaw continued as he stopped again to study one of his roses, who look for spirituality in places where it is not. They look at new age thinking, reincarnation, auras, meditation, synchronicity. But this is only the fossilization of teaching, not living teaching. Everywhere I travel, I find students mechanically repeating old techniques from the East or the West without the essential knowledge of those techniques. That is, what is the goal of the techniques? Have you adapted them and made them personally meaningful and relevant to your experience? We need to go beyond the techniques to the results they might produce. You mentioned my concept of the invisible Sufi at breakfast. We must transform the individual so the path becomes part of daily living. No techniques or rituals can be useful over the whole of your life. It requires a new way of relating and a new ethics. Imagine an entire culture that is truly global, where our humanity and not our national or religious rituals join us, one that goes far beyond what the scholars currently refer to as ecumenism. That evening at dinner, I was introduced to two world-renowned psychologists, 
and a novelist who were staying at Langton House. I had seen them around on the grounds or in the bookstore where I had spent most of the afternoon, but we hadn't been introduced. We all sat at the long table in the formal dining room and discussed what we had learned recently. Shaw laughed a lot, smoked cigarettes with the same enthusiasm as his wife, and as usual spoke very fast. He seemed to be operating at a higher energy level than the rest of us. As I was beginning to recognize, he had a tendency to jump from one topic to the next and back again, sometimes keeping three or four thoughts going simultaneously. After his wife excused herself from the table, Shaw went on, God is in ultimate control, and he creates the future that he wants for all of his creation. To believe that we can evolve ourselves is the ultimate arrogance, yet to believe that we can do nothing about our destiny is being utterly asleep. Here he turned to me. Religious systems have good intentions, as you have been researching them, dear doctor, but we need to stop before the techniques and philosophies build up a false identity for ourselves instead of making us real humans. You know how many deaths have been caused by sacrificing lives for so-called religious principles? We have to be careful. These new times represent the emergence of a new culture in which what is of value in one system can be synergized with parallel values in others. Humanity is at the verge of a quantum leap of self-discovery and conscious group interaction. When we learn to interact consciously, we will activate what has been called our paranormal abilities. Telepathy, clairvoyance, clairaudience. You said you started to experience some of these abilities in communal living in Morocco. Isn't that right, doctor? It is in these sorts of environments that the awakening is most likely to occur. All traditions speak of a time in which the ancient prophecy of unification will take place. The inner schools have set up teaching groups in carefully selected times and places with carefully selected people, not to crystallize these abilities, but to do a specific activation. Then the individuals become like carriers of a positive light with which they gradually affect the rest of society until the new culture of peace emerges. You must remember that you were activated in the group that you joined at the beginning of your pilgrimage in Chile the one Horst was my deputy for. There we established a contact that enabled me to receive you here now and that created in you, like a radio transmitter, a vehicle of activation that can discriminately search out the spiritual knowledge of this age so that later in your life, you will be able to empower others and activate them spiritually. Do you remember this morning when you talked of not being able to remain at this higher vibration consistently, doctor? It's as if we all have a base level of vibrational energy and all of us will follow different paths and go to different places to gradually raise that base level higher until it is possible for you to be of service in activating others through your work or your mere presence. We all looked around the table at each other and I tried to imagine all of us going out into the world so at peace that others were inspired by just seeing us. The next day, as I approached the main house from the cottage for breakfast, I looked through the kitchen window. The beautiful Mrs. Shaw was once again in the kitchen, chain-smoking and cooking breakfast for her children. I thought I would try a little harder to engage her in conversation after our rather abrupt meeting the previous morning. I entered the kitchen and greeted her. After a few moments, I said, In living with Shaw for so long, you must have had a chance to talk with a number of great thinkers. She nodded. He asked that I participate in some of the meals and social events held here for the guests and students. I was wondering whether you've developed a philosophy of your own about where we're all headed, I said. What do you think is the goal of evolution? Mrs. Shaw scooped the fried eggs out of the frying pan and onto plates she set in front of the two children. You will have to ask Shaw, she said bluntly. My focus is clear. I only take care of Shaw, his children, and his home. I felt a bit embarrassed. In Morocco, I had often engaged the wives of the sheikh in discussions about spiritual matters. I wasn't sure if she really had no interest in such things 
or whether I might have touched on a source of past arguments between the two of them. So when Shaw was gone to Switzerland for 10 days, I contented myself with reading his books, the Sufis, Tales of the Dervishes, Thinkers of the East, The Dervish Probe, and the other books in the bookstore on sociology, anthropology, religion, and philosophy. It was awe-inspiring to realize that books had made his teaching available to millions of people. Even though I was a guest in his home, I experienced a knowledge from the books similar to the initiations and other training I had taken in Chile and the United States. This written information contained the same activating factors for the awakening of consciousness. When I grew tired of reading, I took walks in his rose garden, thinking about what would be next for my life. When Shaw returned, we took a few more walks together in his rose garden. He told me about his fascination with electronics and pumped me for what I knew of their use in medical research. I told him about the methods I used in my clinical practice and he discussed them quite knowledgeably, occasionally offering new techniques or models. Shaw questioned the time frames of history, insisting that the church had ignored the first half of humanity's 10,000 years of development on Earth. He also talked of how the world's dependency on money had skewed our sense of what had value. During one of these walks together, Mr. Shaw took a deep breath, turned to me and said, Your stay here is complete, I think. It is time for you to take what you have learned and share it with others. But how shall I do this, I asked him. You can go back to America and become a guru. There are many people there who need spiritual guidance. I have seen the gurus in America, I told him. I think they sometimes lose their essence because of their concern with techniques. Besides, that would not incorporate all I have learned. It is not the whole existence that I feel drawn to. It is so separated from the world. If it is the world you seek, then go into business. That is another area that could use enlightened men. But it is not spiritual. If I was to throw myself into business, I would be as one-sided as a guru. Then you must take your concept of spirituality and share it with others. You are a psychiatrist, and from what you have told me, you feel a vocation to service. Incorporate the two, for you know they are connected. I notice you read when you are not actively studying. If you have so much faith in books, why don't you write one that incorporates spirituality into psychology? You have seen the healing power of the spirit. You should share this knowledge with others.